Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. I appreciate you. This week we're taking a look at a cold case that was solved despite many feeling answers would never come. So as always, I ask you to join me as we remember Carrie Ann Jopeg. Carrie was born on August 17, 1968 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin to parents Carolyn and Robert Jopeg Jr. According to friends and family, Carrie was wonderful and caring. She looked out for everyone. Carolyn stated her daughter had a feisty spirit and did things her way, even if she heard no. Carrie was very persistent. Carrie was very independent and possessed a bubbly personality that drew her peers to her. She wanted to be a veterinarian and had a love for singing. Being Carolyn's oldest child, Carrie pushed her limits but she stated she was a good child. She just had a bad habit of doing the opposite of what you told her. She felt Carrie could do anything, and she wasn't afraid of much. At the time, Carrie was a 13-year-old 7th grade student at Kosciuszko Middle School, and March 16, 1982 started like any day. Carrie lived with her mother, Carolyn, and stepfather, Fred. She left for school, just like she always did. The story seems to vary based upon who tells the series of events. But at some point during the day, Carrie was disciplined by school authorities. According to reports, she was caught roaming the halls without a pass. But per her friend, she punched another student for spilling paint on her new shirt. Regardless of the events that led her to this point, she was suspended from class for three days. Carolyn was called where the school gave her a choice. She could either pick Carrie up from school or she could allow Carrie to walk home. Carolyn knew, although her daughter was probably just being a rebellious teen, she felt she could trust her to walk home from school. Carrie often walked since their house was a short block away, and she was reliable. According to Carolyn, Carrie always told her where she was going and when she would be home. So, ultimately, Carolyn opted for Carrie to walk home, a decision she would later regret. Carrie left the school at around 1.30 p.m. and could typically make it home within half an hour. But, as the hours ticked by, there was no sign of Carrie, so Carolyn called the police. Carrie was listed as a missing person, with her mother fearing she might have run away. Carrie was described as being 5'3", around 90 pounds, and was last seen wearing a white cloth jacket, white top, brown corduroy jeans, and carrying a clutch purse. When talking to her mother, police discovered Carrie's best friend Robin lived just across the street. They assumed since the two were so close that Robin might know where Carrie could be. Robin Mant lived at the home with her mother and older brother, John. Robin explained she had not seen Carrie since yesterday, when she was at their home. The day Carrie went missing, Robin and John had a party in the middle of the day where a handful of friends were invited over, and Carrie was amongst the group. She saw Carrie during the party but didn't see her before it ended. She thought she may have just gone home. Investigators learned alcohol and marijuana were being used at this get-together. During their talk with the Mance, they retrieved the names of other teenagers present who were interviewed on a later date. No one had any idea where Carrie was. Carolyn grew desperate for answers. A search party was formed of 30 people and flyers were created by Carrie's sister. After hours of scouting the neighborhood and nearby areas, the family turned up empty-handed. Their neighborhood was considered safe, and many thought Carrie just ran away and hoped nothing serious had happened. Carolyn and her daughter continued to search for weeks after, until they just couldn't take the disappointment anymore. Carolyn claimed she could only pray that Carrie would be found. As the weeks passed, alleged sightings of Carrie came from parts of town, and their hope was reignited. However, these sightings were followed up on and landed them no closer to finding Carrie. Months passed and any leads that once seemed promising dried up and eventually Carrie's disappearance was considered a cold case. On September 2nd, 1983, Robin Mant's mother decided to renovate the deck of their home. She hired a local contractor who began work that afternoon. While digging up sections of the deck, the contractor's shovel hit something hard. When he pulled the spade out of the ground, he noticed strands of human hair mixed into the dirt. Fearing the worst, he pressed on. John Mant was in the backyard at the time. 
unearth were human remains. Decomposition was so advanced that John could not stomach the sight or smell. He became ill and his body went into shock. Police arrived at the Manth residence shortly after the discovery. The activity drew onlookers from their homes, crowding around the taped off scene, with Carolyn amongst them. The body was buried in a shallow grave around five inches deep. It was described as being in a mummified state. The remains were transported to the state coroner's office, where they hoped to gain a positive identification through dental records. An autopsy was performed where internal bleeding inside of the skull was cited due to a fracture of the C1 vertebrae and a fracture on the left side of the skull. The death was ruled as undetermined, but due to the nature of the injuries, detectives treated the investigation as if it were a homicide. When the news reached Carolyn that a body was discovered, she just knew it was Carrie. Carolyn went to the morgue where she was able to identify the clothing found with the body. Despite what she already knew, police received Carrie's dental records, which provided a positive identification. After 17 months of not knowing, Carrie was found. During the initial investigation, detectives did not have much to go off of, and many of the partygoers were re-interviewed, including John, Robin's older brother. John was known as a troublemaker, and since Carrie was discovered at his house, it drew suspicion. John was in trouble for petty theft in the past, and allegedly had affection for Carrie, even though he was five years older. During his interview, John claimed he only knew Carrie through Robin, and nothing more. He denied having anything to do with her death. Although they were suspicious of his involvement, they had nothing to tie John to the case, so he was ultimately let go. On September 6th, a neighbor called police to report a strange occurrence. They explained they noticed a kid from the neighborhood standing by the man's backyard, and he was behaving oddly. This kid was 17-year-old Jose Ferreira, and according to the caller, Jose was kneeling beside Carrie's burial site and appeared to be crying. He would raise his head towards the sky with his arms up. Jose was described as a weird guy. Allegedly, he was into witchcraft and a heavy drinker. And much like John, he also had a record for theft. Jose was quickly brought in for questioning where he admitted to knowing Carrie. He stated he was depressed and whenever he thought of Carrie's death, it made him sad. Jose also explained he could have been the last person to see her alive since the two were at the party. He denied having anything to do with her death and with no evidence to connect him, he was also not charged. After many interviews, investigators still had nothing to go off of, and Carrie's death remained a mystery. The news devastated Carrie's family and friends, since they were hoping for something, anything to bring closure. Carolyn spent years regretting her decision to not pick Carrie up from school that day, even though she believes Carrie would have snuck out and attended the party regardless. Another break in Carrie's case wouldn't come for six years. In 1989, an inmate at the Dodge Correctional Institute claimed to have information regarding her death. According to this inmate, he was the ex-boyfriend of Robin Mant, and the couple dated during 1983 to 1986. He stated Robin told him that John killed Carrie, and she was left in the basement for two or three days before he decided to bury her. Robin was interviewed again after the shocking confession where she confirmed she dated this man, and they did have a discussion about Carrie's body being found, but she never pinned it on John. She explained that neither her or her brother were involved in Carrie's death. She felt her ex was just trying to get back at her for ending the relationship. Since there was no one else to corroborate this story, it was not considered credible, and Carrie's case fell cold once again. But on October 11th, 2015, police got the break they'd waited decades for. A woman entered the West Milwaukee police station, claiming her husband called her earlier that day and stated he was responsible for killing a female and burying her under a porch when he was a teen. Then on the same day, crisis counselor at the Milwaukee County Behavioral Health Division called 911 to report a call they received. The man explained in 1982, when he was 17, he was at a party when he caused a 13-year-old girl to fall down the stairs. When he realized she died from the injuries, he buried her body to hide what he did. He explained he was calling because he wanted the incident to be publicized, since he was ready to end it all. This man identified himself as Jose Ferreira. 
Jose also called a local news station and told his story for a third time. Jose was detained on October 13, 2015. During a Mirandai's interview, Jose explained what happened that fateful day, 33 years ago. On March 16, 1982, Jose attended John's party, where he met Carrie. The kids in attendance were skipping school. Alcohol was provided, and he at the time opted for liquor mixed with soda. According to Jose, Carrie approached him asking for a cigarette, which he did not have. Instead, he offered her marijuana, which she accepted. After a puff, he states Carrie asked him if he wanted to head down to the basement. He thought the two were going to make out, so he agreed to go. The pair got to the door which led down the stairs, and Carrie went first. Jose closed the door behind him when Carrie suddenly turned back to look at him. She stated, I don't think this is a good idea, and wanted to head back to the party. But Jose looked at her sternly and told her, you are going downstairs. According to him, he then pushed Carrie, which caused her to lose her balance and tumble down the stairs. He observed her body strike the railing, then the wall, before falling to the basement floor. Jose then walked down the stairs and stood over her body, pulling her fully onto the floor, where she was flat on her back. Initially, he thought she was unconscious and saw it as an opportunity to continue what they initially planned to do. He explained Carrie was such a beautiful girl, so he proceeded to fondle her over her clothes. He then tried to pick her up to move her again, when he noticed her neck was broken. Once he knew Carrie was dead, he explained he was scared and felt he had no choice but to conceal what he'd done. He opened an exterior cellar door, which led to the backyard. He used a small shovel and dug a hole underneath the porch, a task that took him about 45 minutes to complete. Due to the ground being hard, he was not able to dig deep. He placed her inside of the hole, then covered her up with dirt. Jose then left the Mant residence and disappeared for days before returning to his home. He was asked by other partygoers about Carrie and what became of her, but denied knowing anything. He was able to contain his composure until a year and a half later, when he noticed construction work began. He knew it was only a matter of time before she was discovered. He waited several days until police and reporters stopped coming around, before he went to her burial site and sobbed, apologizing for what he'd done. He claimed he told his older brother because he needed advice, but his brother pushed him to not tell the truth. Once he completed his statement, Jose allegedly hugged the detective because he felt a sense of relief. Initially, they believed Jose couldn't have worked alone and that maybe John was involved in some capacity, but with no evidence and no indication from Jose, they dropped the idea. When the news came out that Jose confessed to Carrie's murder, the family was thankful but wished it came sooner. Carolyn still lived in the same house on the same block and she knew Jose when he was a teen. Back then he went by Junior and she stated he did not seem like a bad person and she felt it was unlikely that he was the killer at the time. She did state at one point she became suspicious when Jose told her he was being haunted by Carrie. After his arrest, he clarified that Carrie haunted him daily for 33 years and she wouldn't let him rest. His conscience finally got the best of him and he confided in his wife before calling outside parties. Carolyn credits Carrie for solving her own case and not law enforcement. She explained Carrie's persistence drove Jose to the point of needing to tell the truth. He couldn't escape Carrie. And without his confession, her case would likely remain unsolved. Jose was charged with second degree murder and held at the Milwaukee County Jail under a $200,000 bond. His pretrial began in January, 2017, where different theories about his confession were discussed. Prosecution painted him as an individual who hit rock bottom. He was drinking heavily daily, which influenced his decision to come clean. His defense counsel explained Jose suffered with mental illness and wanted to use his confession to convince his wife to not leave him since she'd recently filed for divorce. But with the age of the case and the lack of evidence against Jose, prosecution knew this case would not stand up in court. So instead, they offered him a plea deal. In exchange for a guilty plea, he was offered lesser charges of attempted second-degree assault and false imprisonment for pushing her into a basement against her will, and he agreed. On March 2017, Jose was sentenced to the maximum sentence of five years for assault and the maximum sentence of two years for false imprisonment. After his sentencing, Jose apologized to Carrie's family. 
I can't take back how it happened. From the deepest pain in my heart, I'm sorry. Though the entire truth behind the tragedy may never be known, the family was satisfied with the outcome of the case. They understood the problems prosecution faced due to the age of the case. They felt securing the lesser charge was better than gambling and suffering a complete loss. Carolyn stated at the end of it all, Carrie can now rest, we can rest. As of 2022, Jose Ferreira has completed his seven year sentence and is now listed as a registered sex offender in Wisconsin. Carrie Ann Jopek was laid to rest at the Arlington Park Cemetery in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hi friends, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. As always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so leave them below and we can chat about this case. If you found this to be informative, consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more from me. And if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you friends for your patience, kindness, and loving messages during my healing period. You were all so kind and I can't thank you enough for taking time to send me well wishes. I'm on the mend now, so we should be getting back into a routine around here. You were all the best and I really do appreciate you. But for now, we must part ways. So stay safe out there, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, friends.